Two friends taking pictures of the rising full moon on a summer night. Two teenage kids doing what teenage kids do. When a stranger with a gun and a death wish changed everything. It was violent, it was senseless, and I will never understand it, I will never accept it. I'm Amy Donaldson, and unfortunately, we're all too familiar with stories about how violence shatters lives. But what we rarely see is how they are rebuilt. In a new podcast, The Letter, we relive tragedy, but only so we can hear the rest of the story. The struggle to reclaim lives, the realities of grief, and the possibilities of forgiveness. I believe in miracles. Sometimes I thought, there are no miracles. Yeah, there are, and this is a big one. Follow The Letter at theletterpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. In today's episode of Project Recovery... I had to start doing these I love yous in the mirror because I didn't love myself. I remember I couldn't even pick up the mirror to even just look at myself and say I love you. I just couldn't do it. And I remember just staring at myself thinking, oh my gosh, I can't stand this lady. Make sure you listen to the end. Find us on Facebook at Project Recovery. We'll have that and much more coming up. Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovering. It's brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. Dr. Matt, you notice something different? I, you're looking fresh-faced and ready for life. Well, this is called Camera Ready. Yes. I am camera ready. No hat. This is, this is a podcast. I'm not camera ready for the podcast, but I just got done shooting. Uh, I think um, you have a little product in your hair. I do have some product in my hair. Yeah. Uh, so I was doing some uh, PSAs, if you will, for knowyourscript.org. Right. Uh, and Our when we sponsors. talk about know your script, it's know your script when talking to your doctor, know your script when talking to yourself, know your script when talking to your children. Definitely. Uh, and so they, you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to do this podcast. And uh, the thing I found out over the holiday break was that there's a lot of people listening to this podcast. Uh, a lot of people are getting hope, are getting help, are getting insight from what we get to do every week, and that yeah. is share people's wonderful stories. It's so much fun. Um, I, I really appreciate our sponsor's message also, because honestly, at my house, we kind of talk about everything. You know, we just talk, you know, just whatever's going on, bodily functions, things. We just sort of talk about it. I got it. But I've realized that so many families don't. I mean, I guess I knew that as a psychologist, but but this campaign of theirs has been so helpful in, I think, encouraging parents to, to have those conversations with their kids about the prescriptions and, and the procedures and everything that's going on in that doctor's visit. And that's why it's so important to, uh, if you need more information, go check them out at knowyourscript.org. Now, Dr. Matt, it's 2021. That it is. We made it. And what does that mean? Not much. I mean, it's just, it's another calendar day. I mean, I think for a lot of people, they've put this false hope on 2021 as everything's magically going to be better. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of things improving in 2021. I think there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful. Um, but the reality is it's going to be what you make it, right? I mean, 2020 was, I know plenty of people, I think myself included, 2020 didn't feel too bad. And in fact, in some ways gave me opportunities, albeit forced opportunities to spend more time with my kids and, and, and have some good experiences in life. So I think 2021 will be a fantastic relief and a great year if we make it that. So I'm going to tie it back to the recovery world. Uh, even the other day, I was driving down the freeway, and I had one of those signs above the freeway that said, speeding will not get you to 2021 any quicker. <laughs> and right. I think a lot of people have been racing towards 2021 with this belief that all of a sudden things are going to be better. Right, magically, just yeah. going to poof. Hey, we shot off fireworks. We drank our Martinelli's uh, uh, sparkling cider. Yeah, I never had it, but I heard it's good. That's pretty good. You know, we drank that in uh, 2021. Now everything's cool. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people look at recovery that way. I got sober and everything's going to be cool. Right, as if just sobriety in and of itself is the goal. And that's not the goal. The goal is to be better. Uh, you know, you said it earlier that uh, a lot of us started drinking and using when we were just even kill. Right, right. When life, well, I think the way I've tried to explain it from what I've learned from our guests over the last couple of years is that a lot of people, when they're 
in the throes of their um, addiction. They feel like if I could just get sober, then everything's going to be better. Well, sober kind of technically is just getting you back to that point of life before you started using, right? Yeah. It's just getting even, so to speak. And if that's when you started using, maybe getting even isn't the best goal. It's a good goal. It's a place to start for sure. Amen. But I think once you get sober, the, the, the great examples of people here in our, in the studio who've come in and shared their stories are they, they get to sober and then boom, they're off like a rocket and they're starting to live their dreams and do the things that make their lives full and fulfilling. Not just giving back to the community, but growing themselves. Um, how many people have come in here and they're now running organizations or they've gotten an education and now they're the person in charge at work. They're healthy physically, mentally, emotionally. They have their families back with them. Their relationships are finally what they hoped they would be with their families. And I mean, so that's what I think. I think getting sober is just step one. Just get back to even. And then you want to be following the lead of so many of our guests and take it to so many other levels above that. we got to continually evolve. We've got to learn. And we always right. got to be moving forward. You know, they say a rolling stone gathers no moss. That's right. And so, you you know, you want to be that rolling stone and you want to be moving and continually to evolve. And I think that's what the goal is. Dr. Matt, the one thing I like, and there's many things I like about the podcast, but it's interesting to hear people come in before we find out what they're doing after their addiction, where they find themselves in situations or scenarios that they never imagined that they'd be doing. Right. And that's, you know, sleeping on a park, uh, sleeping with somebody for drug money, uh, spending 18 months in prison. And they go, I never imagined I'd be doing that. Right. Okay. And then, then you take them at that dark point in their life and you can tell them life's going to be better. And I can tell you this, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And they say to themselves, I can't imagine it getting better. I'm so far gone. I am so down. I, life is never going to be good again. Right. I mean. And then it is. And then and then it is. And they're here sharing that story. And and, and that's the crazy thing is that, that for someone to go, I, I could imagine myself ever doing those bad things. And then once they do those bad things, they can never imagine doing good things again. And yet you can. You, you can. And what I've, what's really been insightful for me over the last couple of years on this show is seeing that a person from who starts in any walk of life, we've had some of the very most educated people, doctors, doctors, very police successful officers. police officers, attorneys. We've had these very, very successful people or, or folks at any stage of life can be affected by addiction and taken down to just the depths of despair. But then all of those people, regardless of where they started, they can turn it around and get way past their best previous self to this new level of life. And it's been amazing to me. It's, it's, it's really an important takeaway, I think, from this show is that nobody's immune from addiction. It doesn't it, discriminate. It, it does not discriminate. It doesn't matter if you, you grew up in a very religious household, a very spiritual household, a very educated, wealthy household. None very of those, loving. Loving household. Not, I mean, we've had people in here who they grew up with everything, right? I mean, great parents. Uh, we've even been lucky to have some of their parents on the show. Yep. <laughs> you know, great parents, great family, affluence, education, opportunities. They're playing sports. They're taking cello lessons. They're doing everything. Nothing Nothing completely insulates us from that risk factor. So I, I love that part of it because it's kind of like, whoa, you, we got to be aware that anybody at any time could be affected by this. But as you said, the coolest part is is what people are doing now with their lives. And one of the coolest parts for me is before we uh, introduce our guest, uh, I, I, I get excited because I know I'm getting ready to be taken down a ride, a journey. Uh, and, and, and before we do this, we never really know much about their story. Right. We've got right. the Cliff Note version. Started so, here. This is the ugly part. And this is what I'm doing I had now. somebody the other day say – Say, well, th this show of yours, I've listened to it. I really like it. It must take a long time, you know, vetting all the guests, finding out their whole story. And I stopped them and I'm like, we actually know very little about most of our guests' stories. We want to go on the journey with the listeners. And so we have somebody who we know a little bit about what they're going to talk about, but mostly, we love hearing the stories for the first time along with the listeners. And uh, that's what we're about to do. You're listening to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, more importantly, about recovery. Coming up, we're going to introduce you to our guest today, Sarah Brock. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. 
Don't miss Cold's new season three, where I look into the unsolved disappearance of Cherie Warren, a woman last seen leaving her job at a Salt Lake City office in 1985. Police cast suspicion on Cherie's estranged husband and boyfriend, but never made any arrests or recovered Cherie's remains. Find Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie, anywhere you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Project Recovery. It's the time in the podcast where we introduce our guest. Her name is Sarah Brock. How are you? Good. Uh, the, now, before we put the mic in front of you, you were all outspoken, vivacious, and now you seem a little reserved. Are you, are you a little nervous? No, I'm just waiting for you to tell me to talk. So <laughs> She's ready to go. I, just can't, I normally don't stop talking, so I'm just waiting. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is we were in here waiting for you, Dr. Matt, and uh, Josh, the producer, was setting up the camera so we could get some video element of it. Yeah. And he asked Sarah, he goes, are you nervous? And she goes, no, I tell my story all the time. Uh, and you do. How many times do you think you've told your story? Um, Probably at least 20. And does it... Do you get nervous every time you tell it, or do you think you tell it the same every time? No, I think I tell. I th- I think, I mean, it is in general the same, but and it always is interesting to me how it comes out. Maybe a little different. Um, I tell it. I think just what needs to come out at the time comes out. The important parts. Well, let's get started. How so does your story just, begin? Um, I was born here in Utah. Born and raised here in Utah. Um, to my parents, um, and in a, and in a non LDS family, I only say that because I'm LDS now and oh. I just went through the temple and got sealed to my husband. Oh, congratulations. And so, if, and so being born and raised here in Utah, not being LDS and not having anyone in my family that's LDS, it's like kind of rare. And so still no one in your family is LDS, but you? Yeah. Okay. And um, have they have they um, have they take have they taken that well, like the family um, you you joining the LDS church for my whole life? My mom told me they were a cult, and <laughs> so that's no, kind a lot of, of people think that. Yeah, yeah. so that's normal, and um, <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> that's normal. <laughs> so, that, but that was how your family that's talked about I'm, the church. Yeah, you know, kind and of um, and so. And me and my mom, we've been talking a lot. She's been staying with me this week because uh-huh. it's Christmas, and we and we've been to, and then since we knew I was coming on this, we've just been talking a lot about my childhood. Um, because when I started using and stuff, of course I left home and I didn't talk to them, and I've been absent from my family for close to twenty years, like oh, off wow. and on. So wow. I, um, so when did you start using? Um, I started drinking probably about 13 and um, I think that's that's so common, right, Casey? Just drinking my dad's drinks. I think, my I dad think would have us mixed drinks. He would have his drinks out and you'd start drinking yeah. his drinks, yeah. I mean, wait, wait till dad gets a little bit loose and then he doesn't notice that. Yeah. <laughs> or he gets a little bit loose and he gives in to you. To, Let's you drink. Did he yeah. let you drink with him uh, at that no. age? So you were sneaking it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, and then yeah. we'd refill his vodka to the – because he'd mark them because I think he knew we were drinking oh, them. And so he would mark his bottles. Is this the Casey trick? You and fill then with we water? would fill them with water. <laughs> And then one time he was super mad because he had all water. Did he, did he keep it in the freezer? Because uh, my parents found out that way because my dad uh, came out and says, hey, <laughs> notice this vodka is uh, frozen. And we go, wow, that's crazy, dad. And he goes, do you know how that's crazy? We go, we don't know how. He goes, because vodka doesn't freeze. <laughs> so you guys have been putting water your, in there. Your dad's yeah. like, this is the worst vodka. I <laughs> yeah. It tastes like water. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he beat the crap out of my brother. Oh. Not good. Not good. Yeah, because uh, you didn't make my dad mad. So do you think you grew up in, in a, a loving house or a strict house? How, it was how- strict. And uh, me and my mom were talking about that on our way here. Because my little brother, he thinks that our house, like there was just no laughing or no fun. And, and um, we were talking about it. And my dad w- was just so like, had a, a lot of like, crazy ideas and he's like really outgoing and really like just like 
always just had these random ideas and my mom, she came from nothing. And so she valued everything she had and she takes really good care of everything she has. So to like just go blow everything she has on like a wild idea. Like she did not want to do that. And so what's she, an example of a wild idea? Your well, my dad, 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 I think he started an airplane company when, and I don't think we had enough money. Something happened when I was little, and the tension in our house was just so much. Yeah. You know? And, um, and he tried to roll buy all fast the... cars mm-hmm. and some practical vehicles, and I know that it would just bug my mom. Mm-hmm. And so that our house was just always like in kind of tension. Tension. But my mom just took such good care of us all the time, and we just didn't make my dad mad. I think that happens a lot in households where you'll have one parent and let's be honest, it's often the dad who is sort of a thrill seeker, or adrenaline, a little impulsive kind of a person. And it's the mom who's trying to keep everything stable and calm and, you know, kids in clean clothes and food on the table. Is that kind of how it felt at your house? Yeah. And, and I just, and I... Just did, and I think I just struggled with so many things myself that I wanted to get out of there too. And so I, you know, I did porn school. What kind of things were you struggling with? I, I struggled with school. I struggled with school. Later on in prison, I found out I was dyslexic. Mm. Um, I, di- I didn't know that, that didn't in the get 80s. identified. In, no, <laughs> yeah, in the eighties, it was we, we were just learning about. I, you those know, things I was forging my mom's better, yeah. name on my spelling things in fourth grade. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. yeah, and I would caught she. I remember she signed her name on one little thing, and I kept it in my room, and I'd trace over it on all my spelling tests to, in to fourth grade. Show to, that you had shown her mm, your, your my score. funking yeah. spelling, and I just couldn't spell. And so my little brother Dale, he would do all my homework and. And I would turn it in, and I just struggled in school. I just yeah. and just that dyslexia. Well, dyslexia in the I think late seventies to late eighties, that decade was a time of really trying to understand why kids don't do well in school. And so, so many of us who grew up in that time, uh, whether it was an ADHD type of an issue or a dyslexic issue or a learning disability in math or reading or something, um, just didn't get identified. And yeah. so it wasn't until you were older. What place in the family were you? How many siblings did you have? I was the oldest. So you're the oldest of how of, many? Of three. Of so three. two younger brothers. And my dad would just tell me I was stupid and I was lazy and I was worthless. And I'd just sit at the table and just cry. Yeah. And and um, and um my brother would just do everything he could to help me. Your brother tried to stick up for you just or all the comfort time. you? Just stick up for me. Just do my homework. Just, you know, and then as we got older into junior high, uh, everybody would hide their report cards so I didn't have to turn mine in, you know? They, they the had school. theirs yeah. to, to, to help cover up yours <laughs> as well? The school must have not sent out report cards this year. Oh, Sounds so, like you had some great brothers. Yeah. I do have amazing brothers. Yeah. And so at 13, uh, you start experimenting with alcohol. Yeah. So would you say your dad had a drinking problem? Like like you were saying, I, I'm just going to go out there and you correct me if I, you think I'm wrong. Your dad was abusive. Yeah. He was verbally abusive, tearing you down. Uh, he also was physically abusive, at least that one time with your brother. What, did you did you recognize your dad had a drinking problem or was the abuse separate from substance use? Yeah, I think knowing what I know now, I think he's just functioning alcoholic. Mhm. And because he's functioning just he could work and keep Yeah, and he just you know. always kept a job. And so it just was justified because as soon as I started so he left my mom um probably about the time I was 16 me and him just kept fighting him and me and my brother we just kept fighting a lot and There got to a point where I left to move in with my aunt because I couldn't, me and him just fought so much. And, um, finally, one time I came home and I just told him, you know, if you don't like it here, why don't you leave? And he just packed up his stuff and left my mom. Wow. And, uh, me and my brother, we were so into drugs and alcohol at this point. 
Um, we're selling tickets to kids at school that they could slough at our house if they wanted to buy a ticket. And we were doing like beta fish fights. We were holding fish fights in our garage and different competitions that you could come participate in during the day and just different gambling activities at the house during the day in really? high school. By yeah. the time you were 16. Yeah. So you could spend five or ten bucks and you could get a ticket to our house in the day. <laughs> Is this the first you've heard it? I've yeah. never heard of that. <laughs> no. Yeah. So me and my brother you're... started doing concerts. Like we'd have buddies that were in bands and we just started marketing things and figuring so you, out how we could hustle up some money. So you guys were real and... hustlers at that age. So <laughs> we... let, let me get this right. Let me get this straight. So I'm trying gone. to process so, it all, Dr. Matt. So yeah. now dad's gone. So let's so just dad, figure it. We're dad gonna, leaves. Finally, he's gone and, because and mom have... is going to be much easier to persuade. We can talk mom into stuff. Well, and, and mom's so, super sad. Like she, that's what makes me sad. cry right now. Is she was sad. She was sad. Did you blame yourself for your dad leaving? I mean, it sounds I, like he left after that conversation. Yeah, I felt like I did, but I know in hindsight I didn't. I knew that. But when you're a kid at that age, I mean, the, you, we blame ourselves for a lot of things when we're that age. Yeah, but I knew that me and my brother were not making it easy because I knew that he was so stressed out with work and his own issues. And me and my brother were just not, I mean, helping. Yeah. We were so, not going to but, school. But you know we what? Were not, that, we that's, were getting No, you were selling us. concert tickets <laughs> yeah. to your house. Well, where I'll jump in is that's probably true. You probably right. weren't making it easy on your dad. But those aren't equal relationships at that age. No. A kid who's 15, 16, 14, whatever, that's when kids act out. That's when you explore the world and explore learning your own personality and kids don't make life easy on parents so when i hear parents say well i did that because they were acting out i i have to come back to it and say that's not an equal relationship you yeah. as the parent regardless of your own stuff because of course just because we're older doesn't mean we outgrow our own issues sounds like your dad might have had some mental health issues with with all the crazy ideas that he had all the time that could be a type of mental health issue certainly he was struggling with some addiction and maybe he had, was a lot of times adults, parents who are abusive were abused as children and never had an opportunity to work it out. So we don't really know everything your dad was working through, but he was the dad and, and, and it's not an equal relationship. And, and honestly, there was more responsibility on his side of things to keep things happy and calm at the house, even if you and your brother were a handful. Yeah. So we just continue on in. Um, what kind of you said you were really into drugs? Let's back up just a little bit before concert tickets and and gambling arenas, beta fish fights. Beta fish fights. <laughs> I've, I've heard of that, but I've never seen a beta fish fight, which is okay with me. But um, <laughs> at thirteen, what kind of drugs were you yeah, doing? What, what was happening between thirteen and sixteen? We started drinking. So I am just smoking pot and opium on pot and. Um, a, a lot of acid, um, cause I'm going to a lot of raves mm. and I, um, hanging out with a man who is, is, has about 12 of us. We're selling acid for him at raves. And so I'm going to, we're just going to all these raves. So going to raves started to become a job just for huge you. Huge job. And so as we're going to the raves selling acid, all these different raves, I'm just picking up meth and mainly just meth because there's not that much heroin abuse yet, just mostly. Um, so this is the late 80s? Yeah. And so there's meth out there early and there's 90s. the party, yeah, yeah, early 90s, the party drugs, right? Yeah, party drugs, mm -hmm. a lot of opium and stuff on on your and so what what inspired you and your brother then to bring this back to like a family business selling tickets to the house when when did that start um well because we needed more money and we thought well this could be just really just we have friends that want to be in a band and we need a concert place and so do you like clear the garage yeah out or, and we had yeah. a pretty big backyard and because my dad had just bought, built a new house, like, so we had this big empty yard, and he had just had all this topsoil delivered before he left. So we made him into mud pits so we could have mud wrestling oh events. My God. <laughs> and I think my brother had uh, they were golfing off the back of the porch for a while and wow. hitting 
golf balls and what some pa- lady got their of, window broken. I was going to say, what? Cops what? get called. Yep. Yeah, cops okay. get called a lot. And then um, cops get called because him and like, because there's, we're not in small groups. We're in groups of like 10, 12 They're pretty teenagers. Rowdy, yeah, that. we're getting rowdy. Yeah. And one day, all these teenage boys come in because we're using windows instead of doors. We're just like climbing through the house. Like <laughs> it's a club. And um, like a neighbor calls chaos. the cops. Yeah, it's total chaos. And calls the cops. And I'm home. Oh, because I'm pregnant now at 17. And you were pregnant? Yeah. And. I'm home, and uh, the cops knock on the door. We got a report that some kids broke into this house, and I just so happened to be on the phone with my mom, and I'm like, no, nobody's here. I'm just here by myself, and the and it's the school principal, because we live right next to this high school, and the school cop, and a city cop, and I'm like, nope, it's just me at home. And they're like, no, we know your brother and his friends just came through your back window. And we're here to pick him up on truancy. And I was like, no, we can't come in. And my mom's on the phone. My mom's like, who is that at my house? And I'm like, nobody, mom. <laughs> and they grabbed the phone out of my hand. and So they had shown up to the house. Yeah, they had shown up to the house. And okay. they grabbed the phone out of my hand and and... My mom was like, yeah, if the boys are that, my mom told them, gave them permission to search our house. Well, we had like six, like maybe five foot tall pot plants. We were growing pot oh, wow. under her stairs in the very basement also. So then like the DEA and everyone comes into our house and we had a homeless guy. We had been laying sleep at the house living there this and, this is like <laughs> neverland gone bad like yeah. it sounds like you know like like so the lost boys come home from work yeah yeah she, oh man she was ticked well what what, what it now <laughs> the, so just pot just, plants and mud wrestling don't happen overnight did your mom at any point like it, it, try to downstairs? intervene and and say what is going on you guys need to Mm-mm. she just kind of let you do your thing well huh? no we were we were just um We'd keep upstairs really cleaned up. Oh, okay. So if you walked in, it sort of looked like a regular house? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And then downstairs, you had beta fights and homeless men sleeping. Yeah, because we had several levels to a house. Our house wasn't small. And um, when she'd go to work, she she worked all the time. She's a single mom now. And... um, As soon as mom left, then that's when you guys... Yeah, we'd get going. And... I can. I was pregnant, and I just wore hoodies all the time. And did I your mom the, know you were pregnant? Mm-mm. No. Oh. So, um, there we just didn't tell her anything. We just totally snowed her. Yeah. And so, were you pregnant with the beautiful young lady that you brought to the studio today? No, I was pregnant with my oldest son, Jaden. And I uh, was at a party I shouldn't have been at. <sighs> And um, I did everything I could not to keep him. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to have this baby. And I just did a ton of drugs thinking that this would, like, naturally abort him or something. Or maybe, like, he won't make it or I'm too young or something will happen. And um, I ended up getting in a car accident, a really bad car accident. And they did an emergency C-section and called my mom and told my mom. Was, was that Your the first daughter. she learned about the pregnancy? Yeah, uh-huh. you then, have a you have a grandson, and how is Jaden now? <laughs> He's in the army. Him and his new wife just came to visit us for Christmas. My mom adopted him when he was twelve, I think. You've lived a life. <laughs> I mean. I'm still trying to process everything <laughs> that you have said. This has been the most packed a podcast has been in the first 27 minutes. You know, normally it takes 27 minutes to get to something like this, but we've heard so many things in the first 27 minutes that I'm still trying to process. And the thing is, is that you're radiant. You're beautiful. You're smiling. And it's because God is good. He uh, came into my life and like just changed it because I thought you can't recover I thought you can't recover from that. And then I married someone from Mexico so that he could get his papers. And then another child that I left, 
I mean, I just kept doing damage and damage and damage. I kept doing so much damage. And I kept committing more crimes and more crimes. And um, I got more involved because then I thought, well, how you really get things more organized and more um, crime and more revenue is with gangs. So did you get involved with gangs then? Yeah. So at what age are you when you join a gang? <laughs> I don't join a gang. Um, you started a gang? No, I didn't start a gang. Um, I just help fund and help a gang get more organized because I could see where they were lacking in some organization skills. So in the corporate world, <laughs> that's called that's called a consultant. Yes. So and, 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 a a, consultant. and consultants make a lot of money. Yeah. And and then when they're done consulting and they improve the, the organization, then they move on. Is that yeah. kind of what you did? Like, like yeah. you kind of see the needs of the gang, consult with them to improve what they needed in their gang behaviors, and then you move on and help another gang? Is that kind of how that worked? Yeah. And one day somebody wow. said, Sarah, there's a really, there's a place for you. It's called Montana, and they're the militia. Oh. <laughs> Jeez. Wait, so. Because they had some really strong political well, beliefs. And so they were saying, let's take it to this next level. And yeah. Let's get out of the gang consulting yeah. business and into militia I mean, because, and consulting business. And what I didn't business. understand about the gangs is they really thought I was their property. Right. Um, right. Because right. there's a way to get into a gang that I didn't know existed, and that's through enough good acts towards the gang. They'll just adopt you. Oh, you don't adopt an honorary you, yeah, the, member. Or yeah, there's. Yeah, you get. So you, you're chosen to be. I and think they, you should have claim you. Somebody should have sent you to business school when <laughs> oh, you I'm were. Oh, I'm in fit. that. So, my, so now <laughs> where surprised. I work is actually put me in school. Well, that's some, yeah, because <laughs> she's been doing business, Casey. Yeah. Casey, she's been doing marketing and business since yeah. she was 14, <laughs> selling tickets to her house. Other kids are in social studies. She's selling tickets to mud wrestling and and fish fights. At her house, and then she becomes. I've never heard of a gang consultant. To be at, what, at what I age didn't were you? Know that they, I didn't know. I just you was created like, your own I was, thing. Just like you guys, why are you doing it like this? I think it could be more <laughs> profitable if we do this in this order and uh, streamlining and streamlining. Yeah, and I kept giving all of me to the streets. So, at I what age were you a gang consultant? Uh, probably most of my life. Really. Yeah, and so you and were... and just the streets in general, just any kind of crime and criminal activity to feed anything that was going to create more drugs. And so, uh, just so we can and keep money. a timeline, um, <laughs> what, my life. Yeah, when did you move out? I think I moved out by the time I was seven. After I had my first son, um, I moved out. I lived with that aunt for a year, and then. I moved out of her house in Layton, and then um, I just moved in with that first husband. Yeah, I was out of my house by the time I was 17, and then and I just disconnected with my mom. Um, and so the, in the recovery world, they said it, you're running and gunning. So you're out there doing whatever needs to be done. Uh, I'm getting married. I'm going to Texas. I'm meeting people that need pieces of paper that I'm like, oh, all you need is this and that. And I think you – To get them in the country. To get them, in, to get them wherever they need to go. I'm like, so if this that's is a little... all you're needing, then I don't even understand why a signature is so important. I can't comprehend why people are doing so many things that are so simple. And I'm just trying to get high. And I'm just staying drunk. And I just want to be drunk. I just don't want to realize – I just am trying to fill this void, and I love this um, power. Yeah, I love this. I love this money because I have enough money. I can do whatever I want with it. I have more money than I know what to do with. In fact, I blow so much money on so many things. It's ridiculous. To give uh, our listeners an idea, how much money do you think you're making in a profitable year? I think I made my first million dollars. When I was 18. Wow. And you can understand why somebody would be addicted to that kind of lifestyle and that kind of power. Because here you are at 18, uh, educated from the streets, uh, 
kind of doing whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy to comprehend and, that. And you were saying running and gunning earlier, and I, obviously there's an element of that, but this is different than that. I I think it felt to me like you wanted to be running and gunning, but you yeah. had this this analytic mind that you could you could figure out how to get people the papers they needed. You could figure out how to streamline a criminal business, and people were probably pulling you into that aspect of it as well because you're like, gosh, I just want to party. It sounds like you just wanted to drink. You just wanted to yeah, use drugs. Yeah, I just want fun. I love people. I love a good time. I just love, you yeah. know, I love people, and I just want to have fun, and people just want to be around you me. Sort of so they're this... like, yeah, let's go to her house. Let's go to her apartment. Let's go to that motel room. And in the next two minutes, I can have the place packed mm-hmm. because everyone wants to party and you're getting a little I'm bit of that business all the time. And I'm getting yeah. a little bit wow. of that business, and so so you have it's you. Just so that's much different fun. than I think. This I think you're you're running and gunning. Your use is different, and at a sort of a higher organizational level than we've heard from other guests. Because most guests are running and gunning just to keep their own habit going. But it sounds like you had this honestly, an because some people have an eye for for business, right? Yeah. They, you, you and I both know people that have worked really hard at business and they just stink at it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we know some people that just can kind of walk into a situation and make it profitable. It sounds like that's sort of a natural talent of yours, albeit using it for criminal behavior. But I mean, you were. Yeah. And I, and, and I just was like, Hey, I just remember one day I was in the shower and I, and the kids had come to visit me cause they would visit me sometimes. And my roommate had just went to prison. He had got picked up at the Walmart with a gun and he was going away for 15 years. And, um, I was in my own, uh, I've been in and out of jail, um, for everything, for just from, and mostly my things were just like some DUIs. And then I had a second husband who was, so my second husband shut everything down. My second husband was controlling. Mm. So all these things are going on and it's like so much fun and I'm like partying up and I meet my second husband and I'm so in love with my second husband and he is not a partier. He is not social. He does not care how much money I can make. He does not care who wants to talk to me because he wants me to be at home. He doesn't want me to have a vehicle. He doesn't want me to have a job. He locks me in the bathroom. He takes everything I own away. I have two more children with him. And I stay married to him for 10 years. I'm so in love with him. Why do you think you were so in love with him? It sounds like he took away your life. <laughs> I, know, I know. I don't know. I don't know why I was so in love with him, but I was, and I thought we could just, like, be a real family. And we bought a house together. Was part of you <laughs> maybe tired of the yeah. party lifestyle? and Just wanted to settle down and buy a house, and I thought it would be so amazing, and we had that girl, and... She was finally a plan. Like I planned to have her. Mm-hmm. And I thought this is going to be the best thing in the world to have a daughter. And my three older children are boys. And I quit meth. I stopped using meth. I got clean. I was clean for almost two years. And he was really controlling, but I didn't even care that he was controlling. I became the PTA president. At the kids' school, and I got really clean. And about how old were you at that time? Um, I think I was twenty-five. Wow! So you've done all that, and now by age twenty-five, you're you went from running gang business to now you're running the PTA. Yeah, to just stopping. I, and you we just, moved to Clinton, Utah, uh, just in the middle little, of nowhere. To yep. just Clinton, we moved out Salt Lake, and we moved to Clinton, Utah. I just thought we just lived this quiet little house. And nobody knew where we moved to, and it was just I was going to have my daughter. And I started talking to my mom again, and I start seeing my family, and I start reconnecting with my aunt. And we just have, like, this amazing little baby shower, and 
And I start seeing my family again and everything is going really good. And he and um, she's born and she gets RSV and that's a respiratory infection. And she gets hospitalized in ICU. And my mom, um, they find out that she has a cancer. So at the same time your daughter has RSV in the ICU, your mom gets the diagnosis of cancer. Yep. I think we're home for like a few weeks and my brother, who is still in Salt Lake, is of, um, comes up with one of our close friends, is a buddy, that, and they still party and stuff. And so they come up to stay with me to see Eva and to just stay at my house because they still come up once in a while to just eat real dinner and just see the family and stuff and um somebody has meth and i get high Mm -hmm. and i leave with them and i think i take off for six months so and i just left my new baby with my husband i just leave in the night with the backpack you had been sober how long at that two years two years and really living sort of the ideal kind of american life with a small town PTA, calm, you know, nice home, uh, calm, normal family relationships. And then what What was it about? It sounds like your brother had come to visit before. Why did you choose to use at that time? I think I just couldn't handle the – I didn't have any coping skills. Just because I was clean, I didn't have any coping skills. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know – and I was so stressed out from everything – I just didn't have any coping skills and so when I knew I knew they had drugs. I knew they had drugs all the time though, but I just wanted to escape. I so, just needed a release and I yeah. didn't know how to cope in any other manner. I didn't have even though as a member of the PTA, I didn't have a support group. Right. Just because I, you know, I was reconnected with some of my family, I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't have any kind of support group. I didn't have any real but nothing. I think you said it. I mean, yeah. no skills, right? No skills. And Casey, this is exactly what we've talked about, but sort of magnified because this is what happens when a person starts using when they are supposed to be developing their life skills for dealing with stress. Life, it doesn't matter who you are. Life throws you a bunch of curveballs. We have a lot of stressful situations. So when you're when you're a teenager, when you're 13, 14, 15, you know, going through those years, that's when people start to develop their coping skills. And one of the biggest problems, it's not just neurological, the, the damage that happens when you start using at such a young age, but it's also psychological and emotional and behavioral because you never learn those coping skills. So here you are, you find yourself sober, but without the skills. And when these, I mean, having a new baby, wow, that's a big stressor. And, and how did you feel? With cancer. Yeah, how did you feel about you just reconnected with your mom and then you find out she ha- has cancer? How did you feel about that? I was devastated and I was so scared. And I thought that meant I was going to lose her right away. Like, I didn't realize I'd still have her 12 years later. Like, I didn't. But at that time, we don't know, yeah, right? I don't when know we that. So, yeah, I just. And I didn't have any spiritual and I didn't have a spiritual belief system. So I didn't have a God, a higher power. I didn't have anything in my life. So with the information that you did have, you decided to get high. Yeah, I pack decided a to get backpack high and sneak and out of your split. home. Because wow. I can't handle this because if this Because is, that was the only coping mechanism you'd ever developed. Yep. So I told my brother, I'm going with you guys, grabbed a backpack, and I took off. And about – so I was gone for a few months. And while I was gone for that few months, um, my husband um, got with his brother's girlfriend. And I came back, and she was staying at my house. And I tried to run them both over with my car. Yeah. What caused – what precipitated I, that? I was so mad. I was so mad. I was so angry at everything in the world. I was so angry that this was my house. I was so angry that I was gone. I was so angry I was on drugs. I was so angry that he was there. I was so angry that she was raising my children. I was so angry. I had so much anger. And when I seen him, I just wanted to run him over. What happened? Um, I went to prison. But did you hit him? No, I did not hit him. I'm so glad I didn't hit him. So thankful I didn't hit him. 
and I went to prison. Uh, well, I didn't. I wouldn't have even went to prison that. I, they put me on house arrest, and so like a crazy, I ran. I got another house like a block away from him because I thought, oh, I'm going to stay in the same neighborhood. I'm going to pull this my life back together. I know I've, all, I've been doing drugs, but I'm going to pull it back together really quickly and keep and get my life back. And I and it was just like sand, like I couldn't. Because I still didn't have any skills, and I'm now I'm strung out, and I and I don't have and I don't have anything. What I don't a, have a job. I don't have. What a great analogy! Like <laughs> I wish the the listeners could see what she's doing with her hands, like trying to pick up sand and have it just run <laughs> through your fingers. Your fingers. Wow! Again, That's and, fran- a, and it's frantic yeah. too because you just want your life back so bad, and you can't grab it. And I just remember being so devastated and I went to go pick up my children and um, they, the police officer met me at the school with papers saying that there's a protective order that I couldn't pick them up. Mm. And um, I was devastated. And I was on someone's lawn. I'm crying like the harsh cry I think I've ever cried in my life. And they told me that they're going to take me back to jail or they're going to take me to the hospital. And I saw some Mormon missionaries and I said, what about, can I go with them? And um, the police officer said, well, let's ask them, but you have to stop crying like this or you're not safe to go anywhere. And these guys, these wonderful missionaries, I don't even know. I wish I knew who they were. Um, came in and talked to me and they said, will you let us walk you home? And I said, please walk me home. I don't want to go back to jail and I don't, and I don't want to go to a hospital. So they walked me home and I went home and I probably drank half a gallon of vodka. I started drinking and I'm on house arrest. So I really start just drinking like I drink day and night. I mean, I drink so much. I get so bloated. I have seizures as soon as Sunday hits and I can't get enough beer in me if, I mean, I'm just such an alcoholic after this moment. So I, the whole time I'm on probation and these missionaries keep just coming to seeing me and they keep talking to me and... um. I don't know how, but I got baptized while I was in this state. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I, I heard that the LDS. This is. I heard the LDS Church will pay your rent if you get baptized. This is what I'd heard. So I thought I would scam them out of getting my rent rent paid <laughs> <laughs> while I'm drunk. Okay. So I did try that hustle while I was drunk, and I did get that done, but they didn't pay my rent. So I. <laughs> Joke's on you. <laughs> <laughs> I did get baptized and I don't. They didn't pay my rent. <laughs> but I did wake up wet in my outfit still the next day and my kids had been visiting and my oh, oldest son. You got baptized and didn't change out of the clothes? I or did, guess You're not. still wet the next day? Yeah, in my at least in my underclothing because my, wow. I, my bed was wet. My oldest child happened to be there the next day and... I was like, what is going on? Because I was just so in drunk haze all the time. And he was my oldest child. He's just like, you got baptized LDS yesterday. You're trying to get us baptized Mormon. I called grandma. We're leaving you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there were some some baptismal rules that didn't get followed. Uh, all I know one. is that my children, they that's when my children left me. So the so the kids that they was left, that they was enough. They were done. They left me. Oh, okay, and so they did go with your mom. Yeah, they went with my mom, and I think that's when my oldest son got adopted by my mom, and he took his brothers, and they went to my mom's, and my probation officer showed up, and um, that's what I was getting to as I was in the shower, and I was thinking, you know, what side of the fence are you on? Like, do you want to be a criminal and lit and really commit to this? life or do you want to go have a family with your children and I decided I'm gonna 
I'm going to live on this side of the fence. F the system and I'm going to figure out a way to do enough crime that it screws the system. Like I'm live on this side of the fence. So your moment of insight yeah, was I, I want to be a bigger, better, badder yeah, criminal. I'm screw this system because I feel like the system just took my kids. I feel like the system just took everything in it. It wasn't even the system's fault, but it. But you were this moment, them. yeah, like those police officers just gave me a protective order, and I felt like now it's on. You're angry. I'm, really angry. I'm angry. super angry. So I go and sit pr- and I'm like, hey, you know what? They weren't even sending me to prison. I said, I want to fort with to prison because I want to go meet who's in prison. Send me to the well, <laughs> the belly of the well. I want to meet her and I want to learn. You want to go scams. to school. I want to go to school. Yeah. I'm ready to learn. So you wow. chose to <laughs> I, go to prison. I chose to go to prison. <laughs> Another first on this said, show. No, 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 no. Wait. Ty Hansen. Oh, that's right. That's Ty right. Hansen chose to go to prison. But I, yeah. But, but what's interesting to me here is that, well, as as you're telling your story, I can tell that from a very young age, and and anger is one of, if not the most destructive emotion for us to hold on to. But it feels to me like as you're telling your story, most, if not all, of your, we'll just call it acting out. Was, was anger. You're an angry young kid. You're an angry young adult. You're an angry parent. And finally, now you're like, I'm going to, it's sort of like in, in a. She's defiant by nature. Defiant. Well, it's more than that. I just think you were consumed with anger. And if it's sort of like in a superhero movie, when the supervillain decides to take that extra step and become the supervillain and you decided I'm going to prison I'm going because prison. there's somebody there that's going to teach me to be a super villain. Yeah. You that was your that was your intent, is that right? Yeah. And that's a that's a lot of anger just consuming you. Oh man, there's so much like going to prison was probably the best thing that happened to me because I think I would have gotten myself I probably would have killed somebody else or gotten myself killed like because of how angry I was. So so you put wait, 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 you I my hills. I'm going to stop you right there. You're okay. listening to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. Our guest today is Sarah Brock. She just exclaimed that going to prison was the best thing that ever <laughs> happened to her. We're going to find out why in just a few seconds. So why was prison the best thing that ever happened to you? <laughs> Gave me a chance to calm down, think. Gave me a second to get out of. And you chose this. I chose this. I fought with. I. You know, the, the, the crazy thing is, is that, you know, in this podcast, in the recovery world, a lot of times people have said that going to jail was the best thing that ever happened to me. Right. Going to prison was the best thing that ever happened to me because it did give you a time to stop, to think and maybe reflect upon your life and what got you to this point. Do you think that happened while you were in prison? Yeah, it got it gave me a minute to pull myself together to deal with some things, to accept some things, to s- accept some things that weren't mine. So you didn't go talk to the the belly of the beast and and and, and get your schooling. Oh, yeah, cuz I found out that that's not what was really there in prison. <laughs> I was disappointed. So I came back disappointed <laughs> cuz I thought of, they lied to me. Well, that tuition was steep I, and I didn't learn anything. Well, I was just like, um, this is what you guys are doing here? Like what? <laughs> well, I was severe I because I really thought maybe well, there was gonna be like some real hustling happening like because I was like thinking in a like a well, I could see why you business think that. venture sure. brain yeah like, you you've got that business brain connections like I feel like if our people can get together like let's get some stuff you know I have all these amazing ideas so I'm like running them off people and other people in there are like what. Like, they didn't want to have any. I don't to do want to be that. here. I'm actually doing everything I can to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And you were going to the university. And so I have a therapist in there, and he shows me this far side um, little thing, and he's like, "Sir, this is you." And it is a guy pushing a wheelbarrow in hell, and he's whistling. He's like happy. <laughs> Far side, love that cartoon. Yeah. And he's like, "This is you. Like, you don't know that you're in hell, do you? Like, because I'm happy to be there. I'm like, 
Ready to. I, I think I can pay. I know exactly <laughs> which far side. And it's hilarious because the devil's annoyed, right? Because yeah, this the guy, uh, they, he's torturing this guy and he's like, he's just having he's a great time in prison. Because I'm in, so you know. happy. Like, just because I'm like, yes, like, cool. Like, found my peeps. This is the, yeah, this, I found my peeps. And then I'm like disappointed because these peeps don't even care that they're they don't even want to be they're like not even taking this as like a notch on their belt like they got to prison there. Yeah, not- cause, well, I'm, I hate to tell you this, most people don't think that way. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think that's probably why your, your therapist was like, I got to bust out a cartoon or something because she I'm not getting get through it. to her. <laughs> and then I need a visual I, aid. Then my next therapist and my aunt loves to remind me of this was like, I think your er- eternal optimism is actually hurting you. Because you're so optimistic yeah. that this is not helping you. You need to see that there's some things not going your way. Like you need a little reality yeah. check. Yeah. Well, I, you know, from one eternal optimist to another, I because I am an eternal optimist as well. But sometimes there's something so important right. about feeling that pain and feeling that burn that, you know, your optimism can talk you out of it and right. you can see the bright side of it. But you've got to feel the burn. You've got to feel the pain. And sometimes you don't want to look back and look at the wake of damage you have caused. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's that we, we don't like to look behind us. Because, I was wired that way. Yeah. <laughs> so at what point you're in prison does... Something start to change, or does it? I'm um, not that time. There's another time. Yeah, I have other times. So I, I mean, I get done with that. Per, well, I. Um, How long are you in this time? Eighteen months. Which is a good amount of time. Yeah, they sent me a picture of my daughter that was pretty devastating because um, she's aging, and I wanted her like more than anything. So when I see that she's went from like six months old to five years old. Because I, I still have, like, the six-month-old baby in my mind, and they sent me a picture, and she's five years old with her cute little backpack. I was devastated, like, a mess. And you missed um, all those years of her growing up. Huh? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm not raising her. <laughs> and so um, um, I meet someone in there that is my friend, that turns into my friend, and she's equally as crazy as I am as far as um, – on the criminal aspect of things of uh, she wants to, we think we can build an empire. Um, we get tattoos over this empire. It can be the justice moon empire. And was that the name of your, yeah. Um, cause my name's been moon for a really long time. Uh, cause that's my married name, my ex married name. Okay. And so, and that's all they call you in, Prison and jail is your last name. Your last name. You don't have a name. <laughs> you're just one name. And okay. It's, you're one last name. And my brother's in prison at the same time I'm in prison. And he just so happens to be in prison with, this is the best part of going to prison, is he just so happens to be in prison with my first boyfriend ever that I was boyfriend in sixth grade. Mm. And we rode the bus together in sixth grade. And every day after school, he'd get off the bus and he'd go home and get his cigarettes. And then we'd sit out. We'd go home and make out. And then he'd sit outside my apartment and smoke till my dad got there. Wow. And his name's Kevin Brock. And he's my husband now. So he's your husband now. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Well, I feel like we're, you know, I, I, I really should have caffeinated more to be able to track all this. So this is great know. though. I love it. I, I appreciate wish I got you a flow chart. <laughs> I know that's what we need a PowerPoint. Yeah. We need a PowerPoint. I, I mean, so, I'm so, to, Donna should have told, so, she told you. Yeah, this was she be told me it was a wild story, but I, I had no idea. She's been living with me. Oh my God. She's been like, so I know on the phone. her aunt, Aunt Donna. Oh, you know her aunt. Yeah. This oh. is how we got connected with her. Okay. Donna actually actually went on an Alaskan cruise with me and my ex-wife. <laughs> all right. she's good friends with my mom. Okay. All so, right. Yeah, I mean, this is... Wow, it all I would call Donna and back. be like, Donna, I know things are... And then she'd be like, things are always getting worse for you. I'm like, things aren't actually worse. I'm just between motels right now. And she's like... That's worse. <laughs> and I'm but like, the optimist in you is like, I'm not homeless. I'm not, between motels. It's yeah. not this bad. This next motel might be really nice. Me, yeah. Please get me another motel. And she's like, 
No. Okay, so now, so sixth grade, you and what's his name? Kevin. Je- Kevin. Yeah, she sixth started saying his name. I was like, oh, I don't know if we want to say his name. But well, then she goes, who's I'm currently married, married to. Married okay, to. then you can say his you name. You can say his name. So you and Kevin, sixth grade sweethearts, riding the bus together, holding hands. Get he's he goes home, grabs cigarettes. Are you guys yeah, smoking? Sixth grade smoking. Sixth grade smoking and kissing, and then at some point, those sixth grade romances kind of fizzle out. Yeah, I guess. he moves. Moves, but then years and years later, yeah, he's in prison. He's with in my prison brother. Prison with your brother, and then that's how the two of you reconnect. Yeah, because I'm able to write my brother in prison, and my brother's like, "Oh, you won't believe it! I'm in here with Kevin," and I'm like, "Oh, that's crazy!" And so while I'm in prison, um, a really sad things happen, and my stepmom, who's married to my dad, um, she tries to commit suicide. My stepmom, she drinks and freeze. Oh, wow. A, a, a Coke bottle and climbs in the back for a minivan. Just waiting to die, huh? And thinks she's going to die. Mm-hmm. She's schizophrenic. That's what they've... She's oh. schizophrenic. Been diagnosed with. Mm-hmm. At now that everything's been done and uh, someone found her at a park and ride and saw her in the back for a minivan with a blanket over her and she'd written letters to my sister. So I have a sister who's six, 17 now. And my dad, that she thought that somebody was going to kill them if she didn't kill herself. So that's a schizophrenic thought, right? It's a paranoid delusion. And so she was acting on that paranoid delusion and thought if she killed herself, then it would save the, the her husband and daughter. Yeah. So right when I get out of prison, Julie's in ICU. And my dad doesn't know what to do with my little sister. And me and my dad haven't been close since that whole thing. So my dad calls me and says... Can you please come move in with me and help me raise your sister? Oh, you hadn't been. And how long had it been since you'd had since, contact with your dad? Since I was like 17. Since he moved out? Wow. And so you do it? Yeah. He pays He pays my uh, ter- probation stuff to get me to terminate so that I can be free to leave Salt Lake County because I'm at Orange Street at the halfway house. Well, first I'm at the halfway house, and when I get out of the halfway house, actually my husband is there at the halfway house. Kevin? No, my current one, my kid's dad, the one that has the girlfriend. You tried to hit with the car. The one I tried to run over, and he decides he wants to get back together with me right away. And I tell tell him that I maybe – because I want my kids back. So right. he moves into my mom's house for just a minute and his girlfriend kills herself. Whoa. Whoa. The one that the, has been raising my kids that whole time I've been in prison. And, and she committed suicide. She committed suicide. Wow. So Crystal's gone and she thought we had that plan the whole time that he would leave her as soon as I got out. Which that was not a plan. That was – I didn't even talk to him one time the entire time I was in prison. And so um, immediately after she kills herself, Chris leaves again. Me and him separate again because we can't quit fighting about it because I this is not my fault that Crystal's committed suicide. And I didn't even want to get back together with him in the first place. I just wanted the kids back. And he was saying I could only have the kids back if he came back. And then this whole thing with Julie happens right away. And so I say, well, I'm moving in with my dad anyways to go help my sister. So if I can see the kids up north, then I will. But I've got to go help my dad right now. I don't have time for this drama with you. So I I leave him in my mom's house and I just come straight north to help my dad because that's just... So, so after that, I put that, everything else on pause yeah. and just help my dad, mm-hmm. and um, just go and stay there. And how does that go? It goes great. I think me and my dad repair our, a lot of our relationship because my dad is, for the first time in my life, like just changed. Like this whole thing just changes my dad. Is he still drinking? No, my dad doesn't do anything. He's just devastated. Like this whole thing just devastates my dad. Yeah. And um, he, we're all just worried about my sister because what do you do with – So that you're, this is your half-sister mm-hmm. and she's 
17? Now she's 17. Now she's 17. At the time, how old was she when her mother... I think, I don't know how old she was. She was young. Okay. And and so you stepped in to kind of be like... Just help the, her out. Just yeah. help their house out because it was a mess. Like, you could see things were probably had been unraveling for a while. Like, the house was a disaster. Right. And then they'd been at the hospital, and so... Was, the, was your stepmother... Uh, recovering at a hospital at, yeah at that she was point? recovering at okay. a hospital and she went to um a psychiatric care yeah and stuff and mm-hmm. then she finally got to come home and so i was living in a rv on their driveway after mm-hmm. she came home and how long were you there helping with your dad's family uh, maybe like six months okay not long but just long mm-hmm. enough to like clean up, hang out with my sister, repair some things with my dad. Like we didn't really talk about anything, but it was just like we didn't need to. Like just things repaired because I saw him suffering so much. I just felt for him because like all of a sudden he wasn't like well, you had so some, angry. <laughs> you had a different perspective. You're both very yeah. – you're much older. Yeah. Both of you and in different stages of life. You're now in the stage of life being a parent that he was in when when the two of you were having. And now the, now you're in that stage being a parent and you can probably have some real empathy for him seeing him suffer and go through that emotional pain. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, you've lived so much life. I mean, it's there are so many firsts on this podcast. <laughs> so... Where does it – so this is this the beginning of you turning around? No. No. So you go back out? Yeah. Huh. I um, – Were you using during that six months? Yeah. You were? I keep using because when my husband came back and his girlfriend committed suicide, he was using meth at my mom's house and so I started using with him. So when I moved into my dad's house, I was still using – I was using meth. I was already using like a month out of being out of prison. I was using. I just couldn't. I just was just using. I was just like trying to be a functioning meth addict, you know, just trying to do what I had to do. And I had been on meth for so long at this point. I mean, call it almost it seemed like all my life I'd been on meth. And you just. Well, most of your life you probably I have had been, been on yeah. meth. So it's just like. Whatever, so I went back to um, one of the one of my many million things. I stayed with somebody who had a tree trimming service, and I'd just hustle him up jobs to do tree removal and stuff like that. Just do some marketing for him, and then get a percentage of that, and I could get paid in meth. <laughs> so that was a good deal. And So wait, so now we have a legitimate <laughs> job where you're hustling business for a tree trimming, but instead of getting paid in dollars, you got paid in meth. Yeah. Okay. So there's a few companies that I knew. Because uh, I thought for a second there, wow, she really, now she's finally got it <laughs> legit. Nope, she's getting paid, paid in meth. meth. Yeah. So you yeah. found a couple other companies that would do this. They would sit- pay me in meth for doing some legit marketing for legit services they do. Man, you really have this business <laughs> ability, this yeah. marketing ability. It's I know my it's aunt tremendous. always wants me to go and work with her and I would. I just live so far away. Yeah. <laughs> so so now you're so now you're marketing for meth. I mean just yeah, just anything. If you want something sold, I'll throw some things on KSL. I'll talk to some people and if I like something, usually I talk to everyone about it and then next thing you know it's just sold. So it's Okay. So <laughs> Do you get in trouble again? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because um, I run into some – I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but I thought I should just maybe – there was more – my mom's going to kill me. But my mom's an insurance agent. And so I would go in, and I've been around her enough. I know a little insurance lingo. Um, I thought maybe I could do a little insurance fraud. Sure. To <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> people for do this, it so. for this tree trimming place. Yeah, you, you, you saw the opportunity. Sure. Yeah. 
I mean, when you have an insurance, cl- so there's all these steps, right? And I, and I, like, I could figure out some hoops. And so I decide I'd uh, assemble some stuff and I get going and, um, well, bottom line is people get mad and they start telling on me because they're not getting paid enough because they find out someone else gets paid more. But that they don't understand how this works. Like someone had a bigger job than you had. So that's where they got paid so they more. Were jealous so that, that's jealous. Yeah, some people's happened. insurance fraud So the insurance fraud higher. thing goes down and you get in trouble. Yeah, I start getting in a lot of trouble. So I start getting charges. And so I start getting seen by the detectives and I start getting picked up on – different things and I finally get picked up at a bank and leaving a bank. Were you robbing that bank? Uh no, I was just cash- cashing some checks. Okay. So you end up in trouble again. And so do you go back to prison? No. They actually tell they actually decide there's programs before prison. Ooh. There's a new little thing and I've never had a program before. So they put you in a program. They yeah, but it, <laughs> yeah, it went to Annie's house. Oh. Yeah. So, but it, I, any program wouldn't, I would have done well in because I find God. Um, not because of the program, but because of, of everything I've given to the streets. I'm giving this streets everything I have. And in return, what's it given you? Nothing. I, I'm so depleted. So I, so I globalize. All my charges in Weber County, Davis County, Salt Lake County, Utah County. So basically Utah. I have all – I globalize so many charges in so many counties and I still get charges clear a year after I've been – because of so many cases are still connecting because of how many things I had linked together through all of this check insurance and prescriptions because I – there's some prescriptions in there. And all so, the detective shows me all these pictures. Like, I mean, I have this size of this table, an array of pictures of me at these banks, of me at these doctor's offices, of me at these pharmacies, of me at these gas stations. Like, so they'd really been tracking you, following you. For a long you. time. Yeah. Like, I mean, I have a photo array like the size of this table. Kind of like, makes your mugshot seem like no big deal, huh? Wow. I have lists. I bet my my motion discoveries are like five hundred pages long. Wow! Because you had started to you went insurance fraud, check fraud, um, prescription, prescription fraud. fraud. So you and these these are federal charges at this point, right? Like they're yeah, you know, the feds you, after you. But you can. But if you yeah, so if you plead guilty to them they can't charge you federally so i hurry and plead gu- i start pleading guilty to things as fast as i can plead guilty to because if you plead guilty uh, fast enough you cannot get charged federally and i already know that the feds are not going to indict me unless they have like 99% of their case and so i'm thinking they're just like one case away from having 99 like they i they probably have 98 like if i hurry and just plead guilty so i start Saying guilty to everything, just like, to avoid the felonies. To avoid, well, they're all felonies. They're all, yeah, but the federal prosecution, you want to avoid that. I can just agree to enough things, and I'm like, fort with, fort with, fort. Just send me back to prison. Just send me back to prison. And then I get a lawyer that's like, "Why don't we try this program before parole?" And I'm like, I, "Okay, cool. I don't care anymore. <laughs> like, just let's get me down to Utah County." So that I can plead guilty on those new charges. Like, I just want to plead guilty on them. I'm videoing. I'm doing everything I can to speed my trials along. I'm passing go everything I can do. And then someone else is like, well, actually, federally, you probably would do less time. So I'm like, oh, great. Now what have I done? You know, like, I probably would. So I'm like just sitting there thinking about all this stuff. And I'm like, actually, it doesn't even matter anymore. Like, who cares? Like, and I'm feeling so depleted, like, and so empty. And the day that I get arrested, it actually puts me into jail. Me and my husband, so I... Were you married at the time? No, yeah. Me and Kevin, Kevin gets out of prison. I learned way more things about gangs. I weigh way more violent things. Like, things get way more escalated. And, um... 
we've been living in motels and this is just a whole nother level of street life. And, and my husband, he's been in and out for a long time and he's been in and out of gangs and, um, he, his whole family is from the streets. His dad just got out of prison. His sister's still at a halfway house. His mom died from an overdose. His baby mom just died from heroin overdose last year. There isn't anybody in my husband's family that isn't in prison or on drugs or anything. That's just like he never even seen a normal life. Um, but he always loved the missionaries when he was little, and so he'd always invite them in, and he would get in trouble by his parents for inviting the missionaries in when he was like a five-year-old boy because he would just see him and he'd be in the yard and be like, oh, come to my house, you know? He'd be so excited to see him. And so when he was about five to eight, he asked his mom if he could become Mormon. And his mom said he could, but he had to do everything that they wanted. Like he had to go to Eagle Scouts. He had to go to all the activities. He had to do everything. So for a small moment of time, my husband did everything he had to do. And then he went right back to the street. And then my husband, he's been in and out of prison for a long time. Well, um, this day that we go to jail, uh, he had even made up some, I'm sh I'm shooting heroin, meth, and because I've started using heroin um, a year before that. Um, he'd beat me so bad. He tried throwing me out of a moving vehicle to kill me with our... Which husband is this? My current one. Current one. Okay. Um, we were so strung out, and I just wanted to go with him to Salt Lake so bad. Because I knew he was getting high, and I just didn't... And I just wanted to go, and I was freaking out, and he wanted me to just get out of the car, and I just wouldn't, and... He tried throwing me out of the car on the freeway, and we were just like two psychotic people just fighting. And um, one of my children called. We came back home, and it was Christmas, and my child called the cops on him, and that violated his probation, and he went back to prison for a year. For that year that he was gone, I just started using heroin. And I was going to die. I was just ready for suicide. So that last year of using, I was going to commit suicide. And I, and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I quit, I quit doing everything. I just wanted to die. So I was just doing this little bit of check fraud and these frauds um, on the side, thinking I could just get enough heroin. And I kept trying to overdose. And it was just really really bad um i don't think people know how hollow you can get or how empty you can get when you've just given your whole life to a, a life that and when you look and it's nothing like nothing about it makes you feel like it was worthwhile or worth having and you just want to die and i just wanted to die and so Kevin gets out of prison and and we're back in motels and he's made these shots of meth and heroin and I have mine and we've seen some people and we've sold some drugs and I, and I can't even shoot up these drugs anymore. Like my arms like physically won't even ingest any more drugs into them. My body just can't take any more drugs and we're sitting in a motel and these bike cops roll up on their little bikes and right when I seen them, I knew it was over. It was so over. I knew I was wanted everywhere. I knew they'd been looking for me. I knew detectives had been knocking everywhere. I knew all these things had happened because they had already stopped someone else they thought was me um, at pharmacies. They, I mean, they had been looking for me. 
and I just knew it was over. And I told him who I was. I told him I had drugs on me. I was like, and I went to jail, and I was sitting in that jail, and I had been practicing making nooses because I was going to hang myself. And I had made a noose out of my bed sheet, and I was going to hang myself at the jail. And I didn't think anything about anything. I could. I didn't care. I didn't care about one more thing. I was just gone. I was just empty. And and I was so tired. And I called Kevin to tell him goodbye. And just know that I love you and tell those kids I love them. Sorry I wasn't the person that I should have been. And I really felt sorry for that. But I felt like more sorry that I just couldn't keep doing it or something. I couldn't be that person. I was just so tired. And um, he told me that I needed to find God. And I don't know what in that rung in me. And people, you know, say that the truth will ring in you. And I don't know, but that rung could be so loud because I had never thought about finding God. I never wanted to find God in my life. And they called an LDS 12-step meeting in the pod. And I went to an LDS 12-step meeting, and everything that this woman, this missionary was talking about was telling me that I was for, could be forgiven and that I was loved and that there was probably a way out for me and through a Savior. And I just, like... Like this glimmer of hope in me, like that I really thought was gone. I asked her for the material and I took it back to my cell and I just read all of it. And I got a Book of Mormon and a Bible and I just read all of it. And I just started reading. And I had court the next day and I went to court and I was sitting in this cell and I was just all by myself and I just thought, God, if you're if you really exist, I just want to know you. I don't care what happens with all this court. I don't care what happens ever again. I just if you're real, I want to know you, because what I read in this, if this if this is real, I want to know you. I want to know that there's something greater than me because I can't do this anymore. And I just broke down and cried in that jail cell and said I need help. And and if if I get anything else, I want to know my children. And I went to court and I was ready to just accept all these charges. I just thought I'll just accept all these charges. I was four well with myself back to prison. And... And it, and it, everything will just be the same, kind of. Well, I went, and in the meantime, Kevin had found Annie's house. And I met an amazing woman named Shallon. And she was their marketer, whoever does their intake. And she came and visited me. And that same day, she was like, if I can get you out of here, are you going to make a mess of my house? <laughs> <laughs> No, but I am going to streamline some things. <laughs> I have a few ideas for you. And I said, uh, no, I I just want to change my life and I don't know how. Can you help me change my life? And I think, I, you know, I just, I just don't know how. So she took me to Annie's house. And I went in there with a backpack <laughs> And um, I met an amazing therapist, and I, I had a couple amazing therapists. 
But I had to go through my backpack and I had stolen credit cards and I had stolen checkbooks and I had all this stuff. And we wrote letters to all these people sending them back their stuff. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I would write letters, sending them all their stuff back. Tell them, hi, I'm a impatient therapy. I'm trying to change my life and I have your things. Here's this back, you know, wow. all this stuff. And they had me write all these letters and I just wrote all these letters to all these people. Making amends. Making amends. And I had the hugest amends list. I mean, I just made so many amends to every single person I could. And and I had to start doing these I love yous in the mirror because I didn't love myself. I remember I couldn't even pick up the mirror to even just look at myself and say I love you. I just couldn't do it. And I remember just staring at myself thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't stand this lady. I can't stand her. Like, how does she even get to be here? Like, she should be locked up in prison. You know, she shouldn't have a family or a life, you know. And so I had to do all these I love yous. And I just still have to say I love you to her. And I and I forgive you. And I forgive you. And I forgive you. That's a hard thing to do. <laughs> so I had to keep doing that. Yeah. So as I kept doing those things, they gave me, uh, I got a a grant or some kind of tuition payment thing. Somebody paid my tuition for there because I didn't have any money. To be at Annie's house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't have anything. And Annie's house for the listeners is a residential treatment Treatment center. center, right? It's for just women. Just for women, right. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay there for? 90 days. And in that 90 days, what kind of things happened to you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I uh, I learned how to love myself. And and I and I found a I found God. I found a being greater than me, which I didn't know existed. <laughs> I thought I was the greatest being. <laughs> and um and I started building a a foundation uh, with people in it that really loved me. Mm. And so I started building these coping skills, like how to ha- manage things and handle things. And really, they helped me deal with all my court stuff. So I kept going to court. Like they took me to court every week. Every week I had to go to court and say, yeah, I did that. And guilty, guilty, guilty. And just tack on more things. And except more charges because it was it was all me and so i kept thinking they're going to send me to prison this time today that today is going to be the the straw that broke the camel's back and this judge is going to say you know what this is too many things to be out on a program right Mm -hmm. and they just kept saying we're going to give you this one chance to stay out Mm. we're going to give you this one program then i was like okay And I just kept going back to the house, like, okay, they're just letting me be here, so I'm just going to make the best, you know, I'm just going to do my best, and I just really want to change my life. So I, like, just, okay, what do you want me to do now? You want, And so I wrote a letter to my sons, and I wrote a letter to my mom, and I wrote a letter, and I just invited everyone to process all these letters with me. And so every family group, I was like, you know, I was the only one that was like, I want to process. Like, (laughs) how do I process? Who can I process with? Like, I how do I get this off my chest? Like who do, how do I heal? Like anybody willing to show me how I can heal from this? I want to heal. And so I kept processing everything I could in that 90 days. And I went to church in that 90 days and I met a bishop who let me repent to him, and he was not ready for my repentance. <laughs> I bet he wasn't. <laughs> I bet he was. Uh, um, yeah. Poor guy. Like... <laughs> We're both bawling. <laughs> I don't know if in in Draper, Utah, this tiny little area, I don't know if he had ever heard 90% of the things that I had to say during that repentance of things that I had yeah, done. But you did it. But I did it, and I just got it all out because I needed to just get it out and just go through that process because I believe that's how I was going to heal. So, this, so writing these very personal letters to friends and family – and and to people that you didn't even really know and 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 sitting down and really processing your spiritual life with this bishop what did that do 
what what was that doing for you during that time? Because that's a lot of emotional work you were doing in a short period of time. Oh yeah. Well, and then I stayed another ninety days at the oh sorry at the residential mm-hmm. to just stay because they let me do ninety ninety ninety. Okay. So someone paid my tuition. Thank you out there in the world. Because, well, that's wonderful. Um, Good. I don't know how the treatment center did that because I didn't have any funds. <laughs> right. And um, but the treatment world did that for me. Well, there's somebody out there that that was money well spent. <laughs> that yeah. does that because you are an amazing person. <laughs> so much that when you started your story, I was wondering where this is going to go, and I can't imagine all the things that you have seen. But one thing that brings me back to it is you go, I just got sealed in the temple with my husband. And now we know a little bit more about Kevin. Yeah. Kevin went on quite a journey too. Yeah. We might have to get him in. But right now you're teaching the 12-step program for the LDS. Yeah. Well, we're uh, learning to become facilitators because so we – the LDS 12-step taught taught me so much um, because I – I believe in God. I, I believe God's the reason that my life is the way it is. I think he's moved the mountains that have been here. I think I put in the work, but God is what is my healer, is my redeemer that that that, that gives me this opportunity. And so um, when... I get to talk to people and share my testimony and see them and share this. Then then they're like, oh, how did you do this? And I'm like, well, and I and they know I went to an LDS 12 step. Well, now where's an LDS 12 step? And we're missing facilitators. So I'm like, how do I become a facilitator? Because if we need more facilitator rooms and I want to be a facilitator. Because if we need that, if that's all we need is more rooms, you'll figure out how to places. do it. This is a new program for you to streamline. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and at my work, I only, I usually only hire from the treatment center because now I get to hire my own people and hopefully teach them a <laughs> skill and it's showing up to work on time. <laughs> there you go. And you're college. also going to college. Yeah, because my, because my work was like, yeah, because I started my work as a dishwasher. I manage kitchens. And right now I'm managing a remodeled kitchen, remodeling kitchens. Wow. But, <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. No, I mean, she'll I mean, own either. the Nothing place. That comes out of her mouth She's going to own that now. place before too long, yeah. Dr. Matt, but, what do you think about Sarah's story? Um, gosh, you know, Sarah, you have been so genuine and thoughtful <laughs> in sharing your story. I, I really appreciate it. It's really touched me. But I will say that... It, Going back to being somebody who works with teenagers and kids a lot, your story is a product of not having those skills and that guidance and that stability that kids need growing up and your own um, biological gifts, uh, your personality gifts of optimism, your business sense. You took that and ran with it and I obviously it took you down some – pathways that we've been listening to today that uh, I guess we would say aren't good. Um, But that's what happens when our talents aren't honed and guided. And when you found religion and you found your your spiritual connection, um, I think it seems like now you can hone those natural skills and ability and personality that you have to do good for for yourself and for others. And and um, I wish people could have watched you as you were talking about feeling hollow and empty and now talking about the giving back and the work that you're doing. And I could see that change in your face. Um, people, I don't think, really do know how low a person can get. Uh, but finding meaning and purpose and spirituality in your life, I can tell that you feel full now yeah. and that you're doing things that are giving back. So, uh, I mean, I guess part of the, the message is take care of your kids, you know, make sure your kids have what they have, uh, that, that they have what they need in guidance and support, um, because otherwise kids will learn to survive. And sometimes the way they do it is pretty, you know, pretty scary. 
but you've turned that around and I can tell you the people don't know listening, but you brought your mom and your daughter here today and, um, and I can tell that you're so close with them. And obviously your mom has, uh, survived her cancer diagnosis and she's still here to be part of your life. And that's beautiful. So thank you so much for sharing. That's, I think that's one of the biggest swings in a story that I've heard here in the studio uh, to to going from so low and empty to so full and giving and doing that with somebody who uh, your partner now, your husband, uh, you guys have kind of done what we talked about at the beginning of the show, not just gotten even, but you've gone way beyond even to living a life that um, hopefully other people can set those same goals for themselves. The thing that really, that I guess I would be taken away from this podcast <sighs> is the human spirit and how powerful and strong it really is. Because I've seen you go back and forth throughout (laughs) this whole podcast with cheer and love in your eyes to tears streaming down your face and all the while just telling your story. And I don't think a lot of people have ever had the insight to your story or heard this kind of testimony. I mean, it's... It's amazing because I feel like we haven't touched on everything that's gone on. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I think I want to get you and your husband back sometime and talk about it because what I'm walking away with is, is that it doesn't matter how bad it gets. No. It can always get better. Yeah. And I think people need to keep searching. Like if you're struggling, keep searching. If you – until you find your people, like your people are out there. There's a group. There's a, if it's a meeting or a church or a basketball team or like a coffee group, like your people are out there that are sitting there that you can connect with, that lift you up when you're low, that cheer for you when you're doing stuff. Like that's what helps us stay sober and like going and like get with your people that have your back. Like, We've said it on the podcast so many times. The opposite of addiction is an abstinence. Yeah. The opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah. What you're saying is go out there and make those connections. Yes, find your find people. Find it. Find your people. Yeah. Sarah, Get thank you so much for sharing your story today. You're thank amazing. You. You've been listening to Project Recovery Podcast brought to you by our friends at knowyourscript.org. Don't forget, Project Recovery is a KSL podcast. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. In October of 1985, a woman named Cherie Warren left work at a busy Salt Lake City office. To meet her estranged husband at a downtown auto dealership. She never made it home. Cherie's car surfaced weeks later in Las Vegas. In the parking lot of a hotel casino. No one knows how it got there. Strange. It was strange. Both Cherie's estranged husband and her boyfriend raised suspicion for investigators. I kind of thought that he might have done something. But no arrests were ever made. In Cold Season 3, we dig into double lives, make new connections in the case, and examine the difficulty raised by reasonable doubt. We want answers just as much as anyone else. They have creeps like that now, too, so nothing's changed. That's the new Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie. Now available anywhere you get your podcasts.